Welcome back to The Constitutional Clarion. This video is about how Magna Carta operates in Australia. The reason for making it is that I keep seeing people making rather misguided references to Magna Carta, particularly in relation to rights and legal proceedings. Just as some people have this Disney-fied version of the Constitution lurking in their head, which has no real relationship with the real thing, there's also this fantasy Magna Carta that does the rounds, and it's brimming with inalienable rights that will smite down any current law that impinges upon them. But of course, as you've probably guessed, the law doesn't actually work that way in Australia. So what is Magna Carta? Well, the words just mean a great or main charter. A charter being some kind of formal document that records a gift or a grant or agreement. It started as an agreement between King John and some rebellious barons, which was signed in Runnymede on the 15th of June in 1215. The king reluctantly granted some liberties and protections to free men, not those who were bonded or enslaved, I might add. Now, I recommend that people actually have a go at reading an English translation of the Magna Carta. The original, of course, is more challenging as it's in Latin. And yes, there are disputes about its translation, but I'll come back to that. The reason for reading it is to understand that it's essentially a medieval document addressing liberties in the context of existing feudal law which is frankly incomprehensible to most people today, other than historians. I'll just put on the screen below a sentence from clause 18, which gives you a bit of an idea of the difficulty in understanding it. This is important because one of the biggest problems with Magna Carta is that people take snippets from it and seek to apply them to the legal system that we live under now, when the original words themselves had quite a different meaning within the context of the time in which they were written. But going back to its history, the initial Magna Carta of 1215 was actually annulled not long afterwards, so its life was really short. Different versions of it, however, were issued by different monarchs with the last one being issued by Edward I in 1297. And it's the 1297 version, not the 1215 version, that continues as part of British law. But there's very little of that Magna Carta left in operation as part of British law. In some ways, this is because of Magna Carta itself. It's based on the proposition that the king is subject to the law. It therefore established the foundation of the doctrine of the rule of law. Later in the 17th century, this principle from Magna Carta was revived by Sir Edward Cook, who again asserted that the law prevails over the king and executive prerogative powers. Ultimately, in the constitutional struggle that ensued, Parliament came out as supreme. The consequence is that in the United Kingdom, Parliament has full power to amend or repeal any law and a later law enacted by Parliament impliedly amends or repeals any inconsistent earlier law. So over time, the contents of Magna Carta came to be replaced with subsequent legislation so that very little of it remains. The only surviving provisions in the United Kingdom a chapter 1 concerning liberties of the Church of England, chapter 9 regarding the liberties of the City of London, and chapter 29, the most important one, regarding the administration of justice. Now, how did Magna Carta become part of Australian law? Well, the remnants of what continued to exist of Magna Carta in British law were received, and that's a technical legal term, so were received in the Australian colonies. Now the colonies don't all have the same date for the reception of British law. 
So some of them theoretically may have received a little bit more or less of Magna Carta depending upon when provisions of it were impliedly repealed in the United Kingdom. So for example, New South Wales and Tasmania have the same reception date, which is the 25th of July, 1828, whereas South Australia has a later reception date of the 28th of December, 1836. Theoretically, there could be a difference. In reality, not really. The question of how much of Magna Carta survives in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland has mercifully been clarified by the enactment of Imperial Acts Application Acts, all of which provide that only Chapter 29 of the 1297 version of Magna Carta remains as part of the law of those states. To avoid confusion, by the way, uh, this Chapter 29 in the 1297 version uh, contains what are clauses 39 and 40 in the 1215 version. So if you happen to be reading that one, because I did recommend to you to have a look at it, uh, that's the difference in numbering because the numbering changed over time. It's a little less clear in relation to Western Australia, South Australia and Tasmania. Magna Carta became part of their received law to the extent that it was still part of British law at the reception date, but also only to the extent that it was relevant and applicable to Australia. Hence provisions about the liberties of the Church of England or the liberties of the City of London uh, would not have been relevant and therefore not passed down to Australia. And the same is true of the various feudal land relationship um, provisions. For example, the provision that prevented a constable from compelling any knight to give him money for castle guard uh, if he was willing to perform that guard in his own person or by another reliable man, uh, that provision would not have applied in Australia. Not enough castles here in Australia for that. As the Western Australian Law Reform Commission uh, noted when it did an analysis of how much of Magna Carta continued to survive in Western Australia, it decided that actually only Chapter 29 survived and said, quote, the others being either obsolete, superseded, or never having been part of the law of this jurisdiction. So in reality, that cuts down the scope of Magna Carta applying in any of the Australian jurisdictions effectively to chapter 29 of the 1297 version of the Magna Carta. So what does that say? Why is it important? All right, this is what it says. No free man shall be taken or imprisoned or be deceased of his freehold or liberties or free customs or be outlawed or exiled or any otherwise destroyed. Nor will we pass upon him nor condemn him, but by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. We will sell to no man we will not deny or defer to any man either justice or right. That's the end of the provision. It sounds, for example, that it provides a right to trial by jury to the lawful judgment of a person's peers. But from an historical point of view, it didn't actually mean that at all. As Anthony Arledge and Igor Judge have pointed out in their very splendid book on Magna Carta, uh, which I do recommend um, if you can get hold of. It's a very good read. Uh, they explained that uh, in the following way. They said, criminal proceedings could be commenced in two ways. The first was an appeal by a victim to the court to try the accused. The Charter intended this procedure should continue because Clause 53 provides, quote, no one shall be taken or imprisoned upon the appeal of a woman for the death of anyone except her husband, unquote. The second was by a presenting jury. These were merely ways of bringing an accusation before a court. The truth was established by other means, such as battle or ordeal. Okay, unquote. 
Now, interestingly, you don't actually hear people claim these days that Magna Carta gives them a right to trial by battle or ordeal, um, both of which in, were pretty nasty. Um, ordeal could be by fire or water. Um, a person could be burned and then have their innocence established if the wound healed swiftly. Uh, or they could be dropped into deep water with a millstone around their neck. Uh, and if they floated to the surface, then they were innocent. Alledge and Judge, uh, uh, and I should say, <laughs> Uh, judge is a great case of nominative determinism because he did indeed become a judge. He was the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. Um, so Arledge and Judge also pointed out that Chapter 29 says, by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. And they noted that there's been a long dispute about the relevant Latin word that's used there and how it is translated. Should it be disjunctive or conjunctive? It seems that the majority view is that it is disjunctive, but you can see how translation issues can make a significant difference to the interpretation of Magna Carta, as indeed they do to, for example, the Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand. But the biggest problem with the attempts to use Magna Carta in legal proceedings in Australia is that people seem to believe that it gives them inalienable rights that cannot be altered or withdrawn by legislation. And this is simply not true. As is the case in the United Kingdom, the terms of Magna Carta have only the status of a law which can be amended or repealed directly or impliedly by later laws. If a law passed by the state or the Commonwealth Parliament detracts from a right in Magna Carta, then the later law, that is the state or commonwealth law, will prevail and the right will have been abolished or altered accordingly. Magna Carta is not entrenched in the same way as the Commonwealth Constitution. And that's really critical to understand. In Australia, we've seen litigants rely on Magna Carta to argue that a tax is invalid so they don't have to pay it um, or that they don't have to repay their mortgage or that their conviction for speeding is invalid or that they cannot be convicted for possessing an unlicensed weapon without a trial by jury. Now, don't try this on because all of them lost for the really obvious reason that even if Magna Carta did give them such a right, which is most unlikely given its original feudal legal context and its very limited application in Australia, it's still the case that other laws of the state, such as laws about weapons and speeding laws, will simply override any remaining remnants of Magna Carta. Now, in that case about unlicensed weapons, Justice McPherson, who, by the way, also wrote um, a superb book on the reception of English law abroad. So anyone who's interested in that issue of the reception of law in Australia, do thoroughly recommend um, having a read of that. Uh, he made the following rather weary observation. Uh, he said, I suppose it will help no one to be told that as a matter of history, Magna Carta did not guarantee trial by jury because at the time Magna Carta was introduced, there was no such thing as a jury. But that is history and is really in a sense beside the point. The simple fact is that it is enough to say here that the legislatures of the Australian states have complete power to repeal Magna Carta or to amend it either expressly or by passing legislation, such as the Weapons Act 1990, that is or may be inconsistent with it." Unquote. Chief Justice Griffith, who wrote a good deal of the first draft of the Constitution, so knew what he was talking about, uh, was even more dismissive of this argument about Magna Carta. He said in a 1905 case, the contention that a law of the Commonwealth is invalid because it is not in conformity with the Magna Carta, 
is not one for serious refutation. In other words, the argument was so silly that it did not deserve further discussion. Magna Carta is given great respect by the courts as a historical reference point for the beginning of some very important legal principles, such as the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, and rights to life, to liberty, and to due process of law. It turned out to be far more influential than the barons and the king on that muddy field in Runnymede would ever have anticipated, with echoes of it being found in the French Declaration on the Rights of Man, the United States Bill of Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. As Justice Kirby has noted, Magna Carta has contributed to human rights on an international scale. But no, in Australia, Magna Carta does not trump statute. It might be drawn on to help interpret statute when there's some doubt about it, or when it establishes a right and you have that principle of legality that you need to be clear before Parliament takes away a right. But of itself, if Magna Carta is in conflict with a law, that law will prevail. Under the rule of law, everyone must obey the laws as passed by Parliament, whether they be the King, the Prime Minister, or you or me. Magna Carta does not provide a get out of paying your speeding fine or your tax card, despite the magical thinking of those who wish it to be otherwise. Wishing something to be so does not make it so. Thank you once again for watching The Constitutional Clarion um, and I look forward as always to seeing you next time. Goodbye.